and, and I, you know, I have to, I want to go on record in saying Eric specifically and Terry and Carolyn Hutter have been fantastic at both trying to get me at least a little less stupid about what an HGRI does, as well as just helping me settle uh, as we move across the country from Portland uh, to the area. So that's which grocery stores to go to, which traffic to avoid. All of those are very important uh, uh, codes for how to live here successfully. So I call this Precision Health for All. And what I'm going to do, Eric, tell me how long we have so I can, because I could go for days or weeks or months, you know. I was going to be a Dickens scholar at one point, paid by the word. So, you know, it's like I've never seen a word I can't use. So and at this point, I would say, I mean, I've read your strategic plan. Um, it, it, certainly the part of the strategic plan around genomics and society is particularly near and dear to my heart as a social scientist and as somebody who has spent a whole lot of my career focused on the legal policy and social implications uh, of capabilities. Back in the early days of tel telehealth, I built very successful telehealth equipment um, and, and even workflows uh, with clinical teams when I worked for Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft all those years ago. And technically it worked, but it, you know, the payment model, the entire sort of reimbursement scheme, all of the legal and social implications and the development of workflow were not ready. And in many ways, we've taken 25 years to catch up with the technology and start to in incorporate those. So I am very sensitive to those and the need to work on those early on when you're trying to do bold new innovation. I know enough about Emerge to be dangerous, and I'm excited what we can already learn from the work that you're doing on EMRs and biorepositories, and, um, and certainly on ClinGen as well, in terms of, you know, I don't mean it in a negative way, but how do we make meaningful use of variant data in clinical practice, part of the discussion that you were just having. And not, not only will I, do I think a lot of the experts and a lot of the people that are frankly in our awardee community are part of, we're already parts of the awardee communities at NHGRI, so you've uh, helped fund both training real wheels and sort of moving into sort of the 10 speed and now we'll eventually get to 27 speed uh, bicycle racing on this as, as we go forward in time. Um, I'm a very appreciative of your work, as, as Eric mentioned. I won't go through the whole story here, but the long story short is this is me, the first week of a very imprecise chemotherapy regimen, the first of about 60 over the next 23 years that I went through. Uh, that's me in the summer of 1989, Chapel Hill. My wife was wise enough to get a dog to help me, or a puppy to help me survive that first round of cisplatinum and other nasty things in the, all of the pre pre uh, nausea drug days. So I was I was I was a pretty small guy at that point in my life at age 19 and got a lot smaller really quickly. Um, and I did manage to somehow, and, and I have donated my genetic material to uh, a, uh, two, two different you know, resilience and survivor studies, because you look at my clinical history and say he shouldn't be alive just based on the drugs that we actually put him on. Um, and it was a whole genome sequence as I was uh, in my role as an executive intel years ago, four or five years ago, going around to different genome companies that needed our highest end computing to be able to even make their research or their business model work. And one of these had seen me uh, speak at a uh, nephrology conference years before and you know, said, well, why don't we do a whole genome sequence and, and we'll help you understand our technology that tries to take that and start to visualize that data. I didn't think much of it. I mean, I did. We arranged to have tissue and blood and all of that sort of done. I signed forms that said they could share it with my clinical team. At that point, it took three months of processing on Intel's highest end equipment and the top sequencers that were out there to compare me to the not me. Um, and, and then it, I didn't know, but my clinical team took another four months trying to get people from help from startups, from clinical research, to actually, as the first time they'd ever done it, make sense. And they basically came to a lucky, well-educated guess. They were very precise when they told me that 92% of everything they'd ever put me wrong was destined never to have worked. I now understand that they couldn't actually know that, um, but it was a good guess. But they got enough data and understanding to, to say it looks more like the mechanisms that cause pancreatic cancer are what are causing your cancer. We're going to put you on a pancreatic cancer drug. And they did, and I became cancer-free really quickly, full kidney failure. Intel employee donated a kidney to me because my old ones were failed, and suddenly I'm healthier now at age 48 than I was at age 28 or even age 20. Um, so I came out of that. My wife will tell you in the ICU that I can't remember it, but she took notes because we knew that I wouldn't remember it all. She said, I've got to figure out how to make this kind of stuff available to everybody else. And that's been my mission when I came back to Intel and, and ever since then, so this fits in. 
Um, I've kept a journal since third grade, and yesterday I was actually looking back at what I wrote on 9-11 15 years ago, and it was kind of interesting. You can start to see some of the mindset that I wrote in here. Um, I saw what horrors that I wish I could unsee. Um, I wonder if more will hit tonight, meaning attacks. And then I said, Ash and I can't sleep. We're talking mostly about fear. And in a way, I'm glad this whole ride, this whole cancer ride, has meant we never brought kids into this insane world. I'm not afraid of dying in a terror attack, though I do worry bombings are now in our daily lives as in many parts of the world. Cancer will certainly save me from an explosion. There's one benefit. I could never have imagined. I mean, each year they would say, well, you've got about 9 to 14 months to live. And after about 10 years, I said, stop doing that. And I now recognize that what was happening was sort of two things a complete lack of data and understanding to know how to come up with a definitive diagnosis with me that, stu that stuck. But also, it's pretty clear I was morphing. My tumors were morphing in response to the various things that were happening. So it's true that I didn't probably have one diagnosis that made sense during that period of time. So as we think about that, um, I've been talking to lots of, of folks within NHGRI and people that you fund, even back when I was on the working group and we were hearing from people around the country. So there's been some good, consistent advice from many leaders in genomics, which I thought was summed up well in the bio-IT world piece um, that Alice and Prophet wrote. Um, and it says, one thing Reem would definitely not recommend spending all of the precision medicine in initiative budget. Um, President Obama proposed $215 million to start on sequencing. I would argue you need to spend more time focusing on the effective collection of phenotypes, something that we're exploring and, and, and trying to execute towards and towards the bottom. And we should use the questions that we come up with and expected answers to drive the building of the infrastructure as we go. That theme of learning and iterating as we go is one that I certainly bring from industry, and it's one that I'm going to describe to you here in terms of the mindset and the processes that we're setting up to be able to go for the long run of building out this program. So I'm going to give you a quick review. I, I, Eric shared with me previous slides, so I think most of you know the basics. I'm going to run through this part quickly, but then I'll dive in a little bit more deeply on um, um, the sort of status of things right now. So I believe you know that the Precision Medicine Initiative Cohort Program is part of the broader Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, our piece is to you know, one million or more volunteers reflecting the broad diversity of the US. Um, opportunities for volunteers to provide data on an ongoing basis, and data shared freely and rapidly to inform a variety of research studies. Right? That's, that's the sort of it in a nutshell. The, way, the mission, and this is not a formal mission, but as I came, <laughs> I arrived on a Monday and they said, oh, you need to do some White House prep and briefings because we're about to announce the, the first 33 awards, or it's really eight huge awards, but to 33 organizations. And you need to lead a three-day workshop starting Wednesday because they're all coming to town. So I said, OK. All right, I can do this. I know where the bathroom is. That's, uh, that's a start, and how to park, and then we'll do this. And I, I wrote on that first day when we all came together, co-present for the first time, the initial awardees. I said, really, this mission is to accelerate the science and breakthroughs that drive precision health for all. Um, and using the broader word health, because medicine is a key part of it, but it's not the only part of it. And if you think about sort of you know, all the different, you can go back and read all the different models of, of how science works or how inquiry works, right? But you know, there's different versions of it. But it all comes down to three or four stages of questions, problems, hypotheses. How do we capture data and in, in our kinds of data, secure and clean it and share it? Because it's a very complicated thing to do. How do we unleash science and diverse scientists on top of that data? And how do we then translate that into action, practice, and meaning, as you've just been discussing the challenges of of getting people to accept anything that's non-human data uh, as, as they're informed. And if you think about that knowledge turn, a, a turn that comes from economics that used to be the way they would evaluate um, the, the potential growth of a company, country was based on its knowledge turns, its ability to ask questions and have its workforce walk through the cycle, that takes a certain period of time. And when we succeed, we're trying to shrink the period of time it takes to move through those and let lots more people actually move through those cycles by building the baseline infrastructure of both a million people who are going to trust us to engage with us and provide different kinds of data over time, as well as different kinds of data types. So how do we accelerate that? We certainly are trying to you know, make this a very signature piece of the platform or of the, of the philosophy is a very transformational approach to diversity. I call it often quadruple diversity. So the diversity of people and the American melting pot is going to be able to generate a wide range of cultures and ethnicities and making sure that we oversample and over recruit the understudied with regards to a wide range of people. Wide range of health status. It's not a disease specific 
uh, cohort program. Uh, many of the people will be well at start and will un understand the unfolding of their various uh, health aspects over time. A diversity of geography, and in that we mean <laughs> meteorological diversity, because people's experiences in different parts of the country are very different, different times of year, rural, urban, uh, and all points in between. And, and you'll see as we're making more and more awards, you know, we're working on building out networks of health provider organizations that can help, help us do that, as well as a diversity of data types, right? It'll start with things like surveys and EHR data pulling in, uh, but you know, we will be doing things with wearables, both the existings that, pe that people already have and eventually you know, pieces of technology that we might want to put out into the cohort program. Of course, the challenge is everything times a million gets very expensive, so anticipating the cost curves and everything from omics to mHealth are some of the challenges that we've got to figure out uh, what's the right time to go do these things. And then also a transformational approach to participation. Um, we're not just changing the word subject to participant and being done with it. Um, we're, it, it doesn't also mean that we know how to do all of this yet, um, but participants involved in every aspect of it, from governance to in the invention of questions of what we're going to be doing. Uh, I've just come from and will return to some of the reviews of our current round of health provider organizations, where there are many of them are already experimenting with, you know, what are the questions that our participants want to know and what's the kind of science that they want done out of these particular uh, kinds of studies. And then a transformational approach to data access. Um, you know, one of my goals is to make sure that we don't just use taxpayer money to, you know, let the tier ones who already have this infrastructure might even be able to do a million person cohort on their own um, and just advance them. What is it going to take for us to enable um, citizen scientists, industry, community colleges and high schools to meaningfully participate in using the data and generating science on top of that. I you know, came in on the sort of tail end of the discussion many of you were having about uh, education and your challenges in that regard. It was something I spent a lot of time on in my Intel career of how do we anticipate having a workforce both to do the science and deliver the precision medicine so that technology and, and science don't get there but it can't scale because we just don't have a workforce to do that. And I think that's part of our investments and part of our thinking here as well. Two primary methods of engagement, you've probably heard this before, is through the, what we call the HPO path, so health provider organizations, uh, as well as DV, direct volunteer. So we are working on uh, developing the capacity to get the quality biosamples and physical evaluations that we actually need from anybody that calls a 1-800 number um, or pops onto the website or approaches through their church or through their health provider organization. That's what we've got to be able to scale out and do over time with a kind of wide range of data going into that. So the DV path and the HPO path. So what's going on? I just want to give you sort of a snapshot of what it looks and feels like to be part of this startup team. Um, we are, the, one of the challenges is to get everybody to act as one interdisciplinary platform team. When I said the word platform and we basically are a platform company stitched together from a mix of technology and academic grants as well as staff that we're hiring into the NIH, you know, more than three quarters of the room in there didn't even really know what I meant by the word platform, right? It's one of the first things I said at the first work group meetings. I hardly knew Francis Collins or anybody and I was, happened to be sitting next to him and I whispered to him and said, you do realize this is kind of NIH basically trying to act like a platform company, right? And I guess he thought about it for a while because somehow I ended up here. Uh, be careful what you say in those opening working group meetings. You never know where you're going to end up. So getting those 33 initial awardees as well as the more than 14 or 15 government agencies who are part of the PMI umbrella to act as one team, right, so we can deliver this million uh, person engaged volunteers in these diverse data sets is no small feat. And it's the most important thing that I do out of the gate because if we don't build the culture, we don't build the processes, then we will not be sustained for 10, 20, 50, 100 years for what we want to do here. 33 awardee partners so far, really divided up into 11 working groups. I will eventually, I can't do it today because it's too complex and I can't make PowerPoint do it. I will eventually come in and share with you our departments. And these departments will look like what it would be like if a company was actually going out and building this infrastructure. And it will be made up of people from NIH, from corporate entities, um, from, from academic research centers as we go through. So 11 working groups, the steering and executive committees are actually set up and actually moving forward. 
Um, and you can see some of the working groups actually listed there. I'm still working to build the core team. Um, I will probably send out to you soon um, some additional senior leadership uh, positions that we actually need. There's sort of about seven or eight people and then another about 20 that are holding all of this up right now. Because um, part of the challenge is they're so busy working on the working groups or the protocols that they're the same people that need to be writing the position descriptions and doing the, the searches as we go out here. So a lot happening. Um, hiring that core NIH leadership team. Um, part of what we're also doing, as you can imagine, this being the President's Precision Medicine Initiative, all of those government agencies and partnerships, and I have to tell you, as somebody new coming in to be a Fed, uh, I, this has been unprecedented collaboration that I've ever witnessed or seen uh, in terms of you know, the different parts of the Health and Human Services family being brought together by the Secretary to work towards this common effort, right? On everything like what challenges are we going to have with HIPAA going forward uh, to, you know, what are the policy changes that we're going to need in place? We want to make sure that that support continues regardless of what happens in the election. So we're working on transition plans and making sure that we have not, you know, federal employees as the mesh network keeping this alive regardless of what happens politically above us. This takes time and energy to do right, and it's a key thing that we're working on right now. And then we were building a robust community partners network. There's a top 50 list of community partners that we're working our way through who are national but also have local chapters to help us with everything from recruiting to educating providers, educating community members who will be on the front lines to help us hold this together, um, as well as a, a workshop next week with health, with health and Human Services on all the different community partners they've used coming together to say, okay, what can we do to work together towards this effort? And then also we're using known industry methods. I am teaching people and we are instituting and we are hiring competencies so that we do user-centered design and platform development process. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute because I'm assuming this is the first discussions that we'll have for probably years to come. So I want to get you right into the mindset out of, out, of, uh, out of the gate so that it doesn't become alien to you as I give you these updates and these discussions going forward. The other piece is, uh, thanks to the great work that NIH had already done, the working sessions and listening sessions, some of the pilot grants awards that were actually funded at Vanderbilt and elsewhere, um, as well as what we did were these implementation papers where we said, okay, well, we can anticipate these are the kinds of problems everybody's going to have as soon as you bring all these awardees together. Here's what's going on right now. We're actually rolling out, and it will soon be fully public. There's an image of one of them. We've developed, based on focus groups and ethnographic studies of peoples in their home, with a wide range of, of what the kinds of participants that we expect to come in here, um, what we call the ecology model. And it's, a, it's a basically a segmentation model that cuts across ethnicity and race and age uh, to help us identify these are going to be the challenges. The not for me uh, uh, persona segment cuts across lots of difference. And are we going to, what would we need to do to convince the not for me is that this is something that they can trust and what are their concerns? So there's about nine or ten segments that you'll hear about and for years we will come to talk about of our different success of trying to pull them in. Um, we have a 5,000 person community of beta testers already um, and we're actually recruiting additional to increase the diversity of that 5,000 initial test bed. Um, we're testing consent language in the first five survey model modules with great progress on the next 12. Um, we're iterating a website, the smartphone application that people will be able to come through, uh, a 1-800 number, and all of the data center infrastructure going through security and stress testing. You know, if the president and uh, the national media stand up and say we want millions of people, then we have to have a way of catching that. Incidentally, we expect to have three tiers. Those who are just interested, click here. This exists on our website now. There's a lot more content that's going to fill that website very soon. Those who may want to participate in the surveys and could do it for years to come, we could potentially take millions and millions of people for that effort. And then those who will have full um, you know, biosample um, physical evaluation um, as, as we go forward in time. So we want to be able to set up for people to have different levels of engagement. Um, and by, if you have millions and millions of people that sign up to be sort of members and fill out surveys and consent, it helps you figure out, you know, okay, who from those do we want to invite to move to the third tier so that you can help achieve some of the diversity challenges that you have. We're getting feedback on content. 
on the name, brand, and look and feel. We'll announce the name of the whole program soon. It won't be called the PMI Cohort Program. Doesn't mean very much the word cohort to real people when you go out and actually talk to them and it doesn't sound or feel very good uh, to a lot of them. We're experimenting with different recruitment methods amongst our uh, recipients of different strategies of pulling in from buses and vans that pull up into you know, parking lots to church-based to um, you know, other online tools. And we're drafting a full protocol for the V1, version one launch. Um, it's coming along nicely in terms of the physical evaluation, the survey data, and um, uh, the biospecimen. Um, and then also doing cybersecurity testing, right? No better way to lose the trust of the country uh, than coming out of the gate. And so certainly doing uh, and partnering with the different parts of government and industry to make sure that we're using the best methods. So a lot is happening and all these pieces are coming together. Um, I'll close with a section here that just says, what do I mean by platform approach? So this is a classic diagram from innovation literature. Almost every company in Silicon Valley or every company that does innovation around the country has some version of what's called the innovation funnel. Um, and there's usually three or four different phases or steps to it. You know, out here at the edge of the funnel, it's like you're trying to understand human challenges, scientific discoveries that are happening that may change the game. What are researchers' needs? What are the research questions? What are the new technologies? What are the crazy ideas, right? And that funnel is always open, and we'll have a part of our function that's always sort of trying to keep that funnel open. But then you come through all of that and say, OK, well, with all of these kinds of inputs, we're in the exploration and R&D mode of what are the measures that we're going to do? What are the questions that we're going to ask? What are the recruitment methodologies that we're going to use? At some point, you've got to stop in time and say, we're going to finding this platform. And by platform, I mean everything from what the communications and media plan is and who it's targeting of those particular persona segments to the technology platforms that are in place both to take participant input as well as researchers use that. You move that into advanced development and the reason it gets smaller is you're starting to throw and focus. You're starting to throw features and capabilities that you thought were ready but aren't ready for prime time out of the boat. And then eventually you move into production and launch. And this is a repeatable process. It's a phase gate process where you say, look, this particular program, we're not moving from here to here until it meets these phases. We're not even going to spend the money on the rest of the pieces. Eventually, we will have three teams. We're not there right now, right? We're kind of right here with V1 of the launch, where all those pieces I just described a moment ago are in advanced development, and we're moving towards production. But since this process wasn't used, we have to go back and do some platform definition. Because each awardee and, and NIH all had slightly different assumptions about what they thought the users might do. And you will not launch a product or a platform until you're really clear, this is the definition, this is the minimum, and so forth. So this is kind of where we are. We will ultimately have teams. The operational team that's moving from advanced development to production will always be the largest. It's the most difficult. Somebody back in here in platform definition is a smaller team. And then further back in R&D, um, is an even smaller team. So your resources, resources are usually almost in an inverse proportion to um, the, the way the funnel works. So each release and the mindset that you should be in is this is not a one time we're taking data one time, right? This is a, every 12 to 18 months, we're releasing a new release of the PMI cohort program platform. And in any one of those releases, somewhere between two and four of these things may be true. We have new features for participants about ways that they can engage with one another or provide data to us. We have new features for the researchers. And we're not going to have a lot of features for researchers out of the gate, but we have a plan to build those out over time. By the way, we will borrow heavily and reuse things from Emerge or whatever programs we very much believe in. Uh, you know, Borrow and license and use what's already out there and build only when we absolutely have to. Scientific focus areas and measures will change over periods of time, even though it's a general population study. And then the data capture capabilities. Oh, we're now ready to take in data from anybody's wearable. Oh, we're now ready actually um, to uh, have a set of neurological games that we want people to play and can actually take that kind of data in as well. So just a little bit more on that. You're going to hear me over time use the word landing zones. This is an industry term that just means the targets for what you're trying to do for a launch. So part of what I'm trying to get the teams right now to do, and a, and a little bit of this is retroactive, um, is define for all the swim lanes or all the departments of what we've got to deliver from knowing what the user experience is down to the policy and legal things that we need to have in place before that particular launch. What's the minimum that we would need to have in place to launch? Very crisply defined. What's the goal? And then what's the stretch goal? 
You cannot solve for features of a platform, schedule, and resources all at the same time. And when you define things in this way, it lets you make some trade-offs of saying, well, we could be ready earlier or spend less money if we just went ahead and launched minimum. Nope, it's really important. We've got the money, and we can actually you know, expand out in time to do stretch goal. And then lastly, what I want to talk about here is, because this is going to, and, and, uh, uh, it's going to come into the four very quickly now, this is a framework I made up. This is not the final framework, but I'm just using this as a conceptual framework for you. If you think about um, a bunches of areas of scientific medical knowledge, right? Infectious diseases, neurocognitive, heart and lung, metabolic conditions, cancer, chronic pain, right? And we have a scientific working group actually working on this right now about what's the right framework. Over time, as we do releases, there's a bunch of horizontal capabilities that you're going to apply across this. Prevention and wellness is something that you would want to consider in a lot of these buckets, right? What do we know? Um, disparities and, and reducing, improving access. What research, what science do we know within these buckets? Caregiving, genomics, the M health capabilities from smartphones and wearables, you know, environmental exposure. So there's a bunch of things that are horizontal capabilities. Here's a way to think about the versions over time, right? I mentioned V1, V2, V3. If you take these, these areas of, of thought, right, our V1 launch may only you know, get, in terms of what these different areas need, this much progress. And the way that we're going to be doing this is basically going through a bunch of these areas of thoughts and defining requirements and looking for capabilities that can cut across many, three, four, or five of these particular areas. So V1 might get us this far. You know, V2 might, you know, we, we might have called this the heart and lung release, even though there were capabilities that were a lot about more than heart and lung. But we're ready to add some capabilities that are going to be a game changer for heart and lung. Or v, you know, V3, right, might really boost up where we've been on neuro and cognitive. I'm, I'm getting you into this mindset because with, as we engage with you and as you engage with other bodies of thought and other institutes, trying to understand what's ready when and, and you know, that they'll, we want to get the public and the researchers excited about these different releases over time. You know, we could look at a framework around you know, ultimately focusing where the human need is, you know, a, a dailies approach. I don't know what this framework will ultimately be, but you want to make sure that you're getting requirements from it. So what's next in terms of the spirit of this? is what I'm calling research question workshops. And we started, we did this back in the working groups, but they were very high level. Um, and what we need is to convene areas around this bodies of thought. And then basically the premise of these workshops is this. Imagine the entire PMI cohort program of a million people is focused on just accelerating scientific knowledge and breakthroughs in your particular domain. Near term, what are the low hanging fruit questions and measures for which the scale of something as large as this would be useful? Medium term, what kinds of questions might this pro the platform, the cohort program, answer where additional work is needed to select amongst measures to answer those kinds of questions? And long term, what kinds of questions are ripe for the cohort program of this size, but which need fundamental science and technology development to know the instruments to go answer those? The kinds of attendees that we will want to come to these workshops are research experts in that particular field, co-funders. I don't have the money to pay for all the research on this. We have the money to build the foundation. If we're not building something that's advancing NHGRI's agenda and the various agendas of funders around those domains, then we will fail. We will have built a field of dreams problem where we build it and nobody comes. So we want other co-funders, participant advocacy groups, and providers. And then what we'll do, this is just classic product development. You look across for common capabilities across those needs and put it into those releases. And the negotiation that I will get into over periods of time is, hey, is that really something that needs a million people? If the thing is unique only to your body of knowledge, then we're going to have to work together to get a co-investment to be able to carry that forward, because it just doesn't apply to enough other domains. It does it require a sub-study, or does it require all million people? So that's the mindset. And what I would just close is, I mean, and I, you know, again, as I said, I know at the beginning, I know enough to be dangerous about all the scope of NHGRI. I, I, I kind of know a little bit about CSER in here. Was that what, that was what we called? You were just talking about CSER, but I don't really know what it is, and I'd be in trouble. I'd have to use a lifeline to Carolyn or to Eric or somebody. But defining our genomics read, roadmap and plan in detail, it's not done. And the reason we haven't asked your input into it yet is because we are trying to get the basic infrastructure up and running. And that one of the pieces of advice that I shared with the quote from BioIT World at the beginning, Eric gave it to me again last week, um, is 
get the basics up and running. You know, the, the longer you can wait to do the genome piece, you'll get more bang for your buck. And it's a complicated issue given the kinds of return of results issues that we've got. So, you know, we've got a great sort of 60% draft based on all the public comments and all the input previous. But over the next few weeks, as I get more senior people involved, we'll start a process and build a work group around helping us build our actual genomics plans and the timelines for that. Research question workshops, right? So as we think about the genomic strategies in each of those domains, find ways to drive more ethical, legal, and social implications research as we go and as we grow. Um, I, I appreciated the LC memo. I, you know, I, I saw it more recently. I think I actually saw it back in May when I was on the work group. Um, those kinds of issues I worry more about than actual technology, than cost, because uh, I've been burned so many times of having everything ready except for the, oh, it has to get sutured into the fabric of society. Yeah, that, that's a little bit of a challenge. And then, um, you know, I think we also should explore what ClinGen becomes over time as our, as our capacity kicks in, right? I think understanding what the roadmap and where ClinGen is going, that's something that we've supported and I would expect us to continue to support um, over time. I think that'll be important for us. So last slide, you know, if you think about my own experience, this was in the transplant experience four years ago that was never supposed to happen. That's the uh, Tracy from Intel who donated to me having never met me before. Uh, you know, it was luck and pluck, right, that got me, that, and my personalized uh, health or my precision health experience took 23 years to get there, right? That's not a very scalable model for a global, global population. So how do we make that happen? Routine care and infinitely more quickly than we could otherwise. And I, just, I look forward to making this dream possible with uh, NHGRI and your extended communities. Happy to take your questions. Sure. I, I had two, one quick and one maybe a little more extended. The quick one is the um, vertical bars you had of the different disease areas, were those just examples or mm -hmm. was that meant to be comprehensive? Yeah, the, no, those were, those, were, those were Eric's examples. I mean, we're actually, I've been, there's a, a meeting coming up with the um, IC directors and a, um, a scientific working group that's helping us figure out what those would be. I don't want them to all be <laughs> organ body parts or diseases. I mean, there's a certain level. And I think the way that we'll have to set it up and talk about it with the scientific community might be slightly different. So you can imagine us doing a breathing campaign, right, that, that creates for all of our participants. The number of conditions and the number of institutes that that would cross over would be enormous. So it's not like a real one-to-one -one mapping with all the institutes, but that's partly why we need the framework in place. Okay, I was just gonna say that I, I think you might, you might garner a lot of interest if you had a nutrition and diet bar mm -hmm. in that list. The other comment I wanted to ask, I, I just joined a, a genetic startup company about a year ago, and so a lot of what you're saying is resonating with my learning experience over mm. the last year. And I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, the government is wonderful for doing certain things in terms of you know, stability, um, uh, competence of the staff. I mean, it's just that there's great things the government can do, but there are also some incredibly irritating and difficult things <laughs> around contracting. I'm learning that more and more each day. Around, <laughs> around, particularly around software and around contracting. There's not a wonderful track record of software development and maintenance in many of the agencies in the government. And I'm wondering whether you... Do you occupy a somewhat um, sort of special or privileged position in the government workings that would allow you to? If, if I've been given a magic, stuff? if I've been given a magic ring yet, I haven't been told it. My assumption is, is you know, we'll use the right partner to do the right thing. Um, I mean, we're already looking. I mean, there's a lot of companies, large and small, that are saying, how can we donate capacity and capability to you? Um, there, w there is one aspect of the program, a particular kind of authority called other transactional authority, which does, and if we didn't have it, we could not have attracted some of the companies and others that we've already brought into it. Because um, a lot of these folks have never, even, even this particular round of health provider organizations that we're doing, um, the, the benefit of the other transactional award authority is, is, is there are several, but one of it is it really allows in um, kinds of players who wouldn't normally, normally participate, integrated delivery networks and others, you know, who, who are like, I've never applied for an NIH program in my life. And it also allows us flexibility on the other side of the award to say, oh, wow, we didn't think this part through. 
um, as we've iterated and learned as we've gone, we need to add an additional capability onto that. So it's a it's a legitimate government uh, capability that's been used in other other places, and HH or uh, NIH has, has started using it for Common Fund and others more recently. Yeah, and not everybody has that authority. There's no NHGRI dollars associated with OT authority. It's called other transactional authority. But the way the the PMI money was sort of flowed through into NIH, it was put into a place that has that authority. So. So the program does have OT authority. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but we. Helpful. I mean, I. But I very much use, believe in use the right tool for the job. And we, you know, if we have to make software, um, you know, and even with our DRC, which stands for the Data and Research Support Center, the award is to Vanderbilt and Verily, Google Verily, um, and the Broad, right? Who who have had experience doing those tools. In the case of the PTC, which is the Participant Technology Center, so focusing on that direct volunteer capacity. Um, you know, they have a partnership with Walgreens to help with the national capacity as well as a software company called Vibrant Health. And in many cases, we're using off-the-shelf commercial software that's reskinned or added to um, and going through a FISMA, you know, security process. And that's, you know, important to do, but it's much easier when you're doing it with, you know, fundamental Google layer components that are in thousands and thousands of secure commercial products. I'm interested in the biospecimens and biobanking. Um, you know, it seems that uh, this is going to be a tremendous resource over time, and technology changes over time. And so what you can measure today is not necessarily what you can measure 10 years from now or 25 years from now. So what, what's being done with respect to the kinds of samples that are being collected and, you know, the ability to, you know, keep, keep enough of those available so that they become even more valuable in the future? Yeah, the, it's... I, now, this is one of these things where it's like, wow, if I really felt stupid, it, it was uh, in the meetings where Mayo, uh, Mayo won the award for our biobanking, and Steve Thibodeau there is just fantastic. Um, and they in the working group, in the, in the very near term, the protocol's not completely done, but in the, in the very near term, it will be blood and urine, and they're going through all of the trade-off analyses of how much do we want to hold, how much do we want to put out for awards, what's the range of kinds of things that we want to do. Um, but we're also looking at um, the pros and cons of storage around you know, daily drinking water brought in with the participants and from, um, from different sites, um, hair, um, fingernail clippings. So there's a wide, you know, that trade-off list is being done. And the other thing is we're trying to anticipate what kind of, um, what kind of metadata and other kinds of things do we need to capture, anticipating when we run out of those capabilities and you know, the blood draws three, four, four years from now and then three or four years thereafter you know, are, are sort of set in stone. Partly is that, that innovation process I described is making sure that we've got people in the biobanking world that are looking out at the edge of that funnel of what's starting to move through diffusion of innovation and then wrap that into our five-year strategic plans. That's the best answer I can give you. Well, I, and I would recommend that you know, microbiome stool samples too. Yep. Yep. All of those things are considered, and and I think we'll get to over time. That was that was a really inspirational talk. That I, I, I just want to ask a question about managing expectations. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of money going into this. There are uh, going to be people within the NIH and outside in the outside community who say, well, you know, all oh, that's just taking stuff away from me. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the question is. One of early wins. Do you have a, a sense of how you're going to manage that? And I, I will say that that uh, Senator Alexander visited us mm -hmm. uh, last week, the week before. And as far as he's concerned, this is a genomics project. <laughs> I mean, that's sort of, you know, that, Eric. As far as Senator Alexander, who's who's the, one of the biggest advocates in the Senate right. for this, you know, he it's it's all about human genomes. So so there's a whole bunch of expectations that you have to manage. Um, and nobody's going to expect an early win in the next two months. But how? How? Are you, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think the. I mean, I. <laughs> there's a, a manager I had at Intel, and and he had an equation: S equals R minus E. Success equals results minus expectations. <laughs> and so Collins' law is with me, uh, full on. I mean, to be honest with you, I think some of the expectations were that major science would start being done by the end of this year, and you know, people had, hey, we'll have a half a million people by the end of the year, and I came in and said, no, 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 um, you will hurt us if we try to drive towards crazy expectations like that, and we'll we'll never be able to get off the ground, or we'll do something that's a flash in the pan but doesn't have the infrastructure, the process for the long haul, and could potentially violate our trust. 
Um, the scientific working group, and it's part of the protocol that we're considering, right? I mean, the early wins are going to be, you know, just understanding characterization of survey data linked to geo uh, uh, data. Um, you know, the clinical, the, even the EHR data, we are certainly the health provider organizations who have won the awards um, have demonstrated, and we've done pilots with them to show that they can get the EHR data to us relatively quickly, though they're still slogging with each one to make sure that there's interoperability there. Even for being able to get the EHR data for those coming in through the direct volunteer path, I mean, that's just an enormous challenge, right? They come in from, they may not even have one, and if they do, it could, it's probably, you know, they, they can be completely uninsured, have no access to healthcare, and they're going to be invited into our study. So trying to figure out that over time is going to be part of the key. But part of the, um, the, the expectations management has been to try to get everybody to understand the principles. And there are a lot of people that think this was a genomic study. I think in, and think in some ways, candidly, um, it's partly why Francis and others said, look, uh, there's the practical cost issues. And it's not even so much the cost of sequencing, but the cost of wrapping the human beings that help make this a responsible giving back of information. Um, and, and, and so because of that expectation that precision medicine equals genomics, um, it, it's, it's another reason why we've actually not just started out of the gate doing that. I think we will pilot things um, uh, early next year at some of the sites where we can just start to learn what it's like if you get whole exome or whole genome and our systems ready for that. But in terms of scaling those out, there's a set of criteria and phase gates that we're trying to do to make sure that we wouldn't actually do this until all of these things were in place. Um, and some of, we have not communicated a lot about the program yet. As, we, as, as you can imagine, a program this visible has lots of masters. Um, so, uh, but there's a whole set of communication materials and branding and educational material for different audiences, including the provider community that we're building the capacity to go do, but I'm just waiting for the right timing. It's just back to, you know, I don't want to, if we're going to go out and talk to providers, I want to make sure that we've got the content and the understanding of the kinds of providers that we're going to go do and the support organizations in place. But I, we will, I believe, pilot elements. Um, I'm trying to get off of the notion of one big all singing, all dancing launch. Um, you know, if you're, you're going to start in regions and then scale out. You're going to start with some particular health provider organizations who are more ready and scale out. Um, and you're going to start with four or five different um, approaches to en enrollment of especially diverse populations and then save the other 12 to 15 and, until you start to learn from those. So, you know, the, this, is, this is partly why, and, and the other thing that we're going to be doing is, um, and we're setting up the infrastructure to do it, I will, we will be talking to the, the cohort, to the participants, in a very regular way, saying, hey, we think we're going to do this about then, but telling them, you know what? We think there's going to be a two-month delay, and here's why. I mean, that level of transparency, I think, is just going to be required out of the gate in terms of uh, expectations management. OK, I see many hands. Jeff, and then Mark, and then Gail, and then Sharon. Yeah, thank you for this presentation. I'm a little uncertain still about the role of children in the, mm -hmm. the PMI, uh, and in particular, you know, given the potential influence of prenatal influences and environment on future health, uh, are you going to be um, recruiting pregnant women and uh, collecting samples uh, relevant to pregnancies as part of the PMI either now or down, uh, down the road? Yeah, we will. Um, and and the, particularly the children piece is something that we're not going to start out of the gate with, nor will we do those with cognitive impairment or um, incarcerated populations and so forth. Um, but we have a roadmap and a plan for tackling all of those things with work groups that are going to be working on those. You know, the variability of state law in some of these particular areas is going to be particularly challenging for us. So an analysis of all the state laws that, that add another layer to it. Um, but we will take children, we will take pregnant women, and we will get to the point where we figure out how to take those with different developmental disabilities. Um, some, of the, some of the players that we have on the network um, or in the HPO network have experience with that. So, you know, it's one of these things where it's like we want to learn from and, and, and you need the trusted brands of those and relationships of those local organizations. And in some places they're doing this quite well and how do we extrapolate and teach the rest of the HPOs to do that. But, um, you know, all of that is in the plan uh, um, to work on and, and we just, you know, it's one of these things where it's like focus on a minimum definition, get out the door, learn and iterate as we go. The initiative was announced, I don't know, seven months ago, and you've already awarded eight grants to more than 30 organizations. Uh, seems remarkably fast. How'd you pull it off? What was the process? P partly, um, it, it, the, 
I mean, the, the air cover of, of the president, the secretary, and the director of NIH is both a blessing and a curse. And the blessing part of it was you were able to pull multiple departments. And so many parts of NIH stepped up to help. You know, I mean, I'm based in the director's office. It doesn't have a lot of the infrastructure that something like NHGRI does, or Gary was here earlier in terms of heart and lung. So basically leveraging their expertise to sort of, and their capabilities to get it out of the door. The other transactional award will be the fastest that we've done. We started, like, for this round of health provider organizations, it went out, well, it was, it's going to be a two-month period from end to end, right? I mean, I'm, in fact, I, I have, like, four minutes, and I need to run because i got to get to a review in about 10 minutes away from here. <laughs> but that helps us a lot. The OT makes a big difference on some of these fast turnaround things. And do they have the usual peer review, the usual levels of peer review? Yeah, it, I mean, it's, 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 it's slightly different, but the spirit of what traditional peer review is is, is in there um, in terms of the way that it's done. Gail? Well, first, I'm from Chapel Hill. I work at UNC. Go Heels. Just, yeah. There's um, so many Duke people around, and I love you, but come on. I need no, more Tar no, Heels. No, so. no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> so, but, and so my question, may, it, it probably should wait till later, but it does have to do with the very difficult and contentious debates around how you define race and ethnicity in the context of ancestry populations forgetting about the social factors that are clearly implicated in race and ethnicity and culture. Um, and it sounded to me like what you were saying was something that was really quite interesting, that you've got proposals that are doing some different things, and you're going to see how it works, mm -hmm. and then you're going to look at it and go forward. Is that your plan about this really thorny topic? That's, that's part of it. And each of the awardees had to show us a plan of what their catchment area was, what diversity was on a lot of different axes, and what their strategies were. So, um, and they've signed up to say, hey, we will deliver certain numbers of these people over this period of time. But I think it's one of these things where you're going to want the collective mindset of, you know, hey, this is working really well here, here, and here. Should we make that a, a national, you know, thing that's available across all of, all of the folks that are there? And there's really thorny IRB issues with this as well, right? And, and we have one central IRB for everybody, which is, um, I think, the way NIH is going for these larger projects. But, you know, we're... We're on the cutting edge of figuring out what that means and <laughs> getting all of the locals to be okay with that. Sharon? So I'll be really quick. I, congratulations. I would just say, apropos of this question of how did you do it so fast, I think a lot of the kind of industry terms, like I was sitting here taking notes, and approaches are things that many of us in academics could really benefit from and mm -hmm. many of us running consortia. And it would be really nice to see how some of this, the work going into this would then translate into other aspects. Mm -hmm of NIH funding and planning and the iteration phase and things like that? I think I've already taken elements of sort of user experience and product development classes that I've taught for years. And I finally just said last week to Francis, like, Francis, we got to find more people that know this because I cannot go teach this a thousand times. But um, at some point when I can breathe, I would love to teach you know some of these basic infrastructure to both government and academic folks because it works. And as a Somebody who's been in not-for-profit, academic, you know, large for-profit, and now government. And so there's some methods in here that are very powerful and really tested for a lot of different things. Jonathan? Can you say something briefly about data release, how that's going to work? It's going to work very well. See, that was very brief. <laughs> <laughs> it's like on Star Trek Slightly when they used to more say, about that. how did the Heisenberger <laughs> come to um, it, it will be a, um, it's, it's a risk-based model. Um, and certainly, you know, non-risky data that's de-identified to the degree, you know, when calculating the risks of different levels. Um, you know, much of the data um, will be released to anybody and you know that wants to do a query on top of it. And then it's basically just a risk-based model of credentialing for um, access to increasingly risky data as we go. Um, but it's partly not. It's partly. I mean, that's a that's a certain aspect of the answer. But as I mentioned. There are programs that we want to create and that we have the seeds of for. It's like, how, does, how do citizen scientists use this data? And what's the education and training that needs to be in place to teach them how to use it, not just open up a website and say you can have it? And the same thing true for community college as well. Um, so I, it's, it's, you know, full disclosure, it's like, I mean, and, and Vanderbilt um, and their colleagues own developing those data and resource support tools. And they're well down that path. And you know many of those same people are involved in Emerge and others. So they have experience doing this, as well as BD2K projects. Um, 
but we're not, we haven't spent a lot of time on it yet because it's going to be a while before we start to have enough meaningful data. That, that being said, you know, on the survey data and those other kinds of things, we expect you know, to try to release that very quickly and let people mine it and characterize their own geography or their own community um, uh, 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 right out of the gate as soon as we, quick, as soon as we can. Before I dash, is there anybody on the phone? We have several council members on the phone. Did anybody want to get a quick question in? No? No, no queries to Rudy? Okay. Respectful of your time and your need to get to this review, I think we're going to end there. And Sounds thank good. Thank you so much. And I we, hope you'll have me back. I can't wait will. to learn more from you. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Thanks so much. Okay. Rudy, are we going to take a break now? about 20 till uh, run upstairs and get your caffeine everyone